Let's use these equations to do a few examples. Here we have a 0.5 mole of steam at 100 degrees. A little mistake here. It is condensed to form a liquid and then cooled to 100 degree, uh, 0 degrees C then frozen at 0 degrees C. And just let me say at 100 degrees C. So this is an isothermal condensation of steam into liquid water. Then we have that liquid water, you're going to cool it down to 0 C. So you have liquid water at 0 C. And then you're going to freeze that water at 0 C. Let's calculate the total entropy change for these processes. And here's some useful information here. We have the enthalpy of fusion. We have the enthalpy of vaporization. We have the heat capacity of liquid. And we're, everything is done under constant pressure. So let's calculate the entropy changes for these picture sometimes useful. So we're going to start with steam at 100 degrees C and we're going to condense that into a liquid at 100 degrees C and then we're going to cool that liquid down. We still have a liquid at 0 degrees C and finally we're going to change that liquid into a solid at 0 degrees C. Now it looks like this is a phase change and we'll calculate delta S for that. And this also is a phase change. And here, this we're just cooling a liquid. And so phase changes uh, occur at constant temperature. The way we've written it here, 100, 100, temperature doesn't change. The phase change, the Q that you transfer from a frozen to a liquid, uh, or a liquid to a frozen a set of molecules, that is actually a reversible process. doesn't do any work, but that's a reversible process. So this is reversible. And we can think of a reversible process. Well, we just cool this down. This is also reversible. So let's calculate each step, delta S1, delta S2, and delta S3. And since entropy is a state function, the total entropy change will just be that plus that plus that. So let's say delta S1. That because it's a reversible phase change at constant temperature. We can go back up here. Isothermal change, and we have a reversible process of the heat transferred in or out of the system it's for a reversible process. This is how you calculate delta S. So the first step is Q reversible over T. Q reversible, let's see, we have steam, and we're going to make it into a liquid. What's the sign of Q for this process? Well, it should be negative. I mean, if you go this way, you have to put in heat to boil, go from a liquid to a, a vapor. Going the other way, you release heat. Okay, so that's why steam actually burns, even though the temperature doesn't change. It's because as you go from steam to a liquid, you're releasing heat, and that heat goes into your skin, and you say, ow. What's the reversible heat transferred there? Well, let's see. What we have in the problem is the specific enthalpy of vaporization of water. So that's how much heat it takes to, that's how much heat you would have to take to take one gram of water and change it from a liquid to a vapor. We're going the other way around. So we're going from the vapor to the liquid. So this would be a negative sign here. So if we have a gram, this would be 2.257. I'll put times 10 to the third because we want problem test specifies we want in joule per Kelvin. So this is joule per gram of water. That's an intrins intrinsic variable. We want to change that to the extrinsic heat capacity. So we have to multiply by the amount of water here. We're given one half mole of steam. We have to put in a gram. So that could be easy. 0 0.5 mole. And then let me just continue this down here. We have 18.01 gram per mole. Or that's how much heat was released when you went from the steam to the liquid. We're going to divide all of this by the temperature. The temperature is 100. But remember, this temperature is in Kelvin. So we'll have to change to Kelvin to 73.15. And this comes out to be, plug those numbers in, minus, don't forget that minus sign, uh, 54.50 joule per Kelvin. So that's what it is for the first step. And note the entropy decreased. Sort of makes sense. You have steam gas molecules, and now you're going to a liquid. So yeah, the entropy would, would decrease, because a liquid, qualitatively, you would think, a liquid would have less entropy than the steam. 
So the final minus initial will be negative. Now let's look at this second step here. We're taking a liquid and cooling it down to a liquid. No phase change occurring here. So what is happening? Well, we're changing the temperature. Nine isothermal changes. We're changing the temperature. We know what the heat capacity is. We can figure what the entropy change is for that second step. Let's actually do that. So delta S for the second step, just changing temperature, heat capacity times the natural log of the final temperature divided by the initial temperature. The heat capacity given in the problem, the specific heat capacity is 4.184 of liquid water, joule per gram Kelvin. So 4.184 joule per gram Kelvin. This is the intrinsic heat, this is an intrinsic heat capacity, this is an extrinsic, we have to actually know what the heat capacity is of our system. So we said zero, we have 0 0.5 mole and we have 18.02 gram per mole. So this will give you how many grams you have, that will give you the real heat capacity, sorry I'm running out of room here, times the natural log of the final temperature, final temperature, zero, let's go up here, final temperature was zero, initial temperature was 100. Final temperature, again in Kelvin, don't forget Kelvin, 273.15, the initial temperature was 373.15. Put these numbers into a calculator and you get minus 11.77 joule per Kelvin. Again, it's negative. So well, we expect it negative. Yeah, you have things moving around here at 100 degrees and now you're moving at zero degrees. So qualitatively, you expect that entropy will be negative. Or if you look at it the other way, in order to heat up the liquid, you got to put in heat to the system, increasing the entropy. Going the other way, cooling it down, you got to take heat out. The system is losing energy, is losing entropy, so entropy should be negative. This is for the second step. Now let's look at the third step. The third step is a phase change, just like we did here. Only we're going here and we're taking heat out, so it should be negative and we're given in the problem the for that phase transition yes here it is a molar enthalpy of fusion fusing is melting and we're solidifying so we'll have a negative number here so for that third step delta s3 that's equal to just q reversible which we can get from a phase transition divided by the temperature of the phase transition in the problem 6.01 we have to figure out how much heat was put in so we know what the molar enthalpy of fusion is 6.01 times 10 to the third joule per gram per mole sorry let me go back here um, <laughs> kilojoule per mole enthalpy of vaporization oh, I seem to be hallucinating here so 10 to the third joule per mole duh okay joule per mole we have 0 0.5 mole, so this will give us how much heat in joule that it takes, or that actually is taken out of the system to take a half a mole of water in a liquid state and put it into the solid state at 0 Celsius. And again, T is in Kelvin, 273.15 Kelvin. So the entropy, uh, entropy change here, putting those numbers in, a minus 11.69 joule per Kelvin. So the total entropy change delta S is delta S1 plus delta S2 plus delta S3 and that's equal to, let's see what are our numbers here, minus 54.5 minus 11.77 minus 11.69 adding all those up we get minus 77.96 joule per Kelvin. All right, so that's how one does uh, those kinds of calculations. Let's do another example. We have a ideal gas, has a heat capacity of 20.78 joule per mole Kelvin. Again, this is the intrinsic heat capacity. To get the heat capacity of a problem, we need to figure out how many moles we have. All right, so this ideal gas occupies 11.2 liter, one atmosphere pressure, zero C. The volume of the gas has increased 22.4 and the pressure has decreased to half an atmosphere all at zero Celsius. So the temperature remains the same and you're doubling the volume 
and decreasing the pressure as you might expect for an ideal gas. Calculate the entropy change for this process. Well, maybe we'll go back here and see what sort of... Oh, look, uh, isothermal volume changes. So it was isothermal. Uh, the temperature didn't change. The volume changed. It was an ideal gas. And we're doing only PV work, so it looks like that would be a useful equation to use. So we'll use that one. Delta S is equal to N R times the natural log of the final volume over the initial volume. How many uh, moles do we have? Well, you can say N is equal to PV over RT, but you can also remember at one atmosphere and uh, zero degrees C, ideal gas volume is equal to 22.4 liters. Okay, go back up here. We have 11.2 liters at one atmosphere zero C. If we had one mole, it'd be 22.4. So this implies that N is a half a mole. Or you can go ahead and plug it in here. Well, either way, you get it uh, 0 0.5 mole. R is 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin. You can also use, as you do in here, 0 0.08 to 1 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin. We prefer it in joule because the problem asks, oh, it doesn't ask, so let me put in here, in joule per Kelvin. So let's use the R that has a joule in it. And I did poor planning on my screen real estate here. So <laughs> let's see what I can do. Uh, okay, so this is a separate. So now we have to multiply this by the natural log of the final volume, 22.4, over the initial volume, 11.2. So the entropy change for this process comes out to be a 2.88 joule per Kelvin. Right, note that's positive. Sort of makes sense if you have a gas at one volume and then you increase the volume. Yeah, entropy would probably increase. And it does with positive value. Now you're probably, or maybe you're not probably, but maybe you are wondering, well, what about the pressure change? So I changed the volume, so what about the pressure? I mean, don't you have to take that into account? Well, it's either one or the other. Uh, we'll just go ahead and use the pressure change, delta S is minus nr times the natural log of the final pressure over the initial pressure. So it's minus 0 0.5 mole, 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin, times the natural log of the final pressure, 0.5, initial pressure, 1, and this comes out to be exactly the same, 2.88 joule per Kelvin. So you either do it one way or the other. Because it's an ideal gas, you have PV is equal to nRT at constant temperature. This is a constant. So that means there has to be a relationship between pressure and volume. You, can't cha you can change one, but then the other has to be calculated from this equation, the ideal gas equation of state. So you don't really get uh, two degrees of freedom. There's no really uh, two contributions to the entropy change. You either did one or the other. They're one and the same. So that's the entropy change there. And then finally, this is not a numerical problem, but just think about it. Uh, consider a refrigerator, bad assumption, but let's do it anyway, as a car, no engine running in reverse. And why do refrigerators run more in hot weather? All right, so let's write down the Carnot engine. Remember, we had a high temperature reservoir, we had an engine, and then we had a low temperature reservoir. Heat was transferred to, from the high, end of high temperature reservoir to the engine. The engine then did some work on the surroundings, and then some heat was transferred to the low temperature reservoir. So that's a Carnot engine. Now let's run this in reverse. Let's do work on the system. So somehow we have some external thing here. We're going to put we'll do work on the system and it's refrigerator. So what we're going to do is separate the two, so actually drive a temperature gradient by doing work on the system. So this is now our refrigerator. And again, we'll have the low temperature reservoir. And this will be the inside of the refrigerator. We want to cool down. Here we have the high temperature reservoir. And this will be, I don't know if you ever looked at the back of the refrigerator, there's some coils back there, and that's the high temperature. And what we want to do is do 
work. So in this case, heat is transferred from the high temperature to the, to the engine. The engine does work. And there's some heat transferred then from the engine to the low temperature to do that cycle. In this case, what we're doing is we want to take heat from the low temperature reservoir, cool the thing down, and put it in the high temperature reservoir. So that's a refrigerator, uh, which is a heat engine running in reverse. Now remember, for the efficiency of um, a Carnot engine, we have efficiency as 1 minus the temperature of the low reservoir divided by the temperature of the high reservoir. So if we have a very efficient engine, we get a lot of uh, work out for the amount of heat we're transferring here into here. Now we want to transfer some heat here. It's sort of the opposite here. So in this case, uh, you're having the heat flow from the high temperature to the low temperature. Here you want to go reverse. So you would think, oh, how much work do I have to do if this high temperature reservoir is sitting in a hot room, for example, in the refrigerator, those coils in a hot room. That means that you have to transfer a lot more, do a lot more work in order to transfer that heat from here to here. If this is already, this is say the room, so here you have some heat and now the heat's going to be transferred from the coils in the back of the refrigerator into the room. If this room is high temperature, you're not going to have very efficient thermal. So you got to do a lot of work to pump that heat out of the low temperature into the high temperature reservoir. And if it's in a hot room, you got to do more work. Qualitatively, that's it.